Welcome to another Coffee with Sam Show, where we speak with ASX companies and the guys who run these companies. We're here at the uh, UWA Club here in Crawley on the University of Western Australia campus on a very beautiful day. And I've got Brett Hazeldine from uh, OD6 Medals. The one? Yep, OD6 Medals. Um, the coat on the SX is OD6. Uh, current market cap about 18.95. And share price about 18.5 cents from the last I saw. Look, um, Brett, you guys are a rare earth story. Um, maybe just give us a welcome, I should say. Welcome. And give us an intro to yourself in OD6. Uh, thanks for your time. So I'm metallurgist is my background. So I started um, 25 years ago in uh, Sons of Gwali in the middle of nowhere in Leonora and Laverton. And I've worked my through, way through diamonds, uh, copper, gold, uh, construction companies as well like Fleur, worked for Newcrest. Um, so I've done multiple different commodities from operations, uh, construction studies, development, and then into the junior space for probably the last 10, 15 years. So my background then now is really a, a corporate development guy. So we actually go build things. So that's been my sort of track record for the last few years. Um, Callium Lakes, I was a co-founder of Callium Lakes, which is potash up north. Uh, I was involved with Iron Valley, which is something that's uh, now with Minres and BC Iron. Uh, so that was getting that developed. Uh, Boddington Gold Mine, uh, a few others, Prominent Hill, etc. So I'm on the development side, so not just the discovery, but actually a development uh, operator. Okay. And in terms of OD6, uh, OD6 is a new company, so really only listed on the ASX in June this year. So OD6 was born out of uh, three smart um, geologists, effectively. And what they were doing was looking at uh, the historic WAMEX, or the Department of Mines database, effectively. And um, mining that data that's available from historic drilling and everything else, looking at throughout Western Australia. And one of the little areas that they were looking for was a rare earth company. And rare earths coming out of Esperance was something that was sort of drilled about 15 years ago by a couple of other companies. It wasn't sexy at the time, but that sort of started a staking rush in the area, and away it went. So, hence yeah. we are here we are today. I mean, the rare earth rush, is, as we just discussed, is, it's come a bit of a sudden um, event, you can call it, because rare earth, uh, apart from that little bleep in 2011 where it, it, it had its limelight, it's pretty much sat in the background all this time. And, and lots of guys like Arafura and, and, and um, Northern Minerals and all these guys has seen limited success in trying to market that concept. What, what brought this on? Um, is there something that brought it on and just w w woke up one day and the clouds moved and it was a great idea? Yeah, look, I think, uh, as, you, as you say, it moved from 15 years ago where it was sexy to not being sexy and then the governments of the world have actually woken up to a lot of the supplies located in China and Myanmar and it's going into a lot of the uh, electric vehicles, um, a lot of other things that really need to sort of drive the de decarbonisation world. So that's then driven um, our smart guys to actually then go look at it, where can we find rare earths. You've obviously got the hard rock rare earths up north, um, like Linus of the world that's running, but a lot of the other guys just haven't been able to get it across the line. But now the, the demand story is actually there, the demand's going through the roof. Um, you're going to need probably a dozen new mines in the world over the next um, 10 to 15 years to actually meet that demand. Um, so the guys then look for those resources in those areas and uh, OD6 was there was no, none of those tenements were pegged, so we've actually pegged them ourselves. And then you've seen uh, a few of the others in the area like Mika and Mount Ridley as well. So there's a few different uh, companies that have then expanded out of that whole knowledge and then kept on developing. So we're all on that same learning curve, but um, the guys like Arafura and uh, Hastings, for example, they've done a lot of the hard work for the industry as well over the last few years. Yeah, yeah, they have. I remember Hastings was, when they started, was. Uh, like, oh, geez, it's a bit too space age for us kind of conversation with investors. Yep. But um, they're having a good laugh now, I guess. Yeah, that's um, right. And Elon Musk's helped everyone. I mean, uh, Tesla. Oh, yeah, and good old Elon. Elon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, help, he's helping everyone at the moment. He's yep. going to Ukraine now. He's, yep. um, look, I guess um, the project, it's a big project. I mean, uh, I'll let you go through with it, but Splinter Rock and Grass Patch are the two areas. That's correct. And Splinter has a huge strike, 30 kilometres by 60 kilometres. I mean, a lot of people may only see those as numbers, but when you're actually trying to visualise, that's that's a big area. Yeah, it's massive. Um, massive area. Um, yeah, 
can you just give us a rundown on the project you know what what you did because obviously um what were your drillings you're not drilling 300 meters you're doing 30 40 50 you know they, thereabouts right in yeah, that kind right. of vicinity so um yeah tell us about that project so splinter rock that's our flagship project uh, Splinter Rock was historically drilled uh, looking for gold and then a little bit of rare earths probably 15 years ago. So there's what we're now doing is going back in there and drilling a historic line effectively that was drilled about two to four kilometres apart. Hit some really good intersections of between one, two thousand uh, parts per million trio effectively, so your total rare earths oxides. Um, so that gives us good confidence that we, there should be something there and that then comes into the economics going forward as well. Uh, in terms of the area of Splinter Rock, so it's about 2,600 square kilometres, which is, to give you a scale, that's almost, it's actually bigger than ACT in terms of size. So in terms of Australian Capital Territory, it's bigger than that. Um, it's like driving from Perth up to June Lapp or down to Rockingham. So massive area that you're dealing with. So what we're now trying to do is now narrow down to where the best parts really are. So we know there's some uh, existing strike length there, but we might find that the best part isn't actually on that strike length, it might be somewhere else. So we're looking at um, a couple of different smart solutions to try and target the drilling uh, as best we can. But if you start looking at 30 kilometres by 60 kilometres, which is the strike length that we're looking at at the moment, it's all the clays are all interdispersed between all the granites. So the granites were the host rocks like icebergs, and then they've been uh, weathered off into the clays over time. And the clays are sitting both on the granites, but also uh, on the sides there. So we're now targeting those, those clays that are really close to the surface, low stripping ratio going forward, really thick. We don't want three to four metres, we want 10 to 30 metres of thickness. And then that gets your economic drivers uh, really going through the roof uh, from that side of things. Okay. Um, well, that's good. I mean, is there a number PPM that, that is like, well, what, what is the spectrum? Are we, is there a 10,000? Are we going to be looking for 10,000 or are we looking for 5,000 or are we looking for threes? Yep. What's that number that for us to look at? Yeah, so hard rocks are generally the higher grade type thing. So they're percentages, so one, two, three percentages. The, uh, the 1,000 ppm equals 0.1 of a percent to give you a, just a guide. So clay rare earths are like a big, massive uh, area of uh, clay effectively. And they're low grade gold mines is the best way I could put it instead of a high grade gold mine. But you've got massive amounts of um, throughput that you can put through. So in my view of the world, a couple of hundred ppm isn't going to really cut it. Um, that might be your cut off grade, but you're really going to be looking for a thousand ppm as your sort of input grades to make these things economic to start okay. with. Uh, and then the difference with a lot of the rare earths in there is what your percentages are of other, so there's 15 to 17 different rare earths depending on if you include a couple of others, the yttrium and scandium. But you really what you're looking for is neopridium and praseodymium to be plus 20%. They're the, in terms of the grade. That's gonna provide you the biggest value driver um, for the economics of a project. So that's where the bulk of the revenue will come from, from those two, a little bit from dysprosium and tibidium as well, which are all associated with magnets. So if we can target those and get those highest grades there, that's what dr then drives the economics, 1000 ppm, uh, shallow resource, so between five to 10 meters in depth, but 10 to 30 metres in thickness is what you want of those uh, ore bodies. And then that will give you a really good economic mine in our opinion. Okay, so you're talking about 20, 25% of the 1,000 ppm, yep. right? Not, yeah, okay. So 250 ppm neodymium and praseodymium, yeah, yeah. that you get those, that's what's gonna drive 90% of your value. Okay. In okay. terms of your revenues. So in terms of the market, um, is that still, the market for rare earths? I mean, people use the term REE, but as you said, there's more than one yeah. element in there, right? Yeah. So are those two boys still the They're still key? The, the main key ones. Uh, Dysprosium and Tibidium are probably the other ones in terms of value. So you're looking at uh, Neopridium, NDPR, let's call it in, uh, yep. sitting at about $100 um, a kilo at the moment. Yep. The Dysprosium and other ones can be up to 1000 or higher. So there's higher value, but um, less use for them at the moment because the NDPR is going into all of Elon Musk's um, uh, motors to get a drive the Teslas and everything else. It goes into your wind turbines, but it also goes into a lot of consumer goods as well. So that's the other driver. I, I, as you're, you're describing, I thought um, a fantastic uh, 
marketing ploy for years if you found a deposit yep. you name it after him yeah that's right <laughs> you know you you get all the attention that you need well he's entering our lives everywhere i've got a little farm down south as well and i've got his um uh sky, starlink starlink yeah and that's changed uh, what we can do down there as well so i can sit down there and have these wonderful interviews as well and it just flows like you're sitting in perth oh really yeah well, that's, it's fantastic that's good. You, you you got a contract with him already haven't you? <laughs> i wish <laughs> <laughs> Look, I guess in, in I know you're a metallurgist and stuff, but in terms of the geology, the exploration for it, are you guys seeing any trends to help you? Because as we say, you know, thirty by sixty is a big space, yep. um, and and I think a lot of people need to be actually standing on the ground and think of where the space because it's big. As you say, it's like us standing in Perth and, and going to Joondalup and Rockingham, right? Yep. Pretty much sixty k's apart. Yep. Is there any sort of, are you learning stuff as you see? Are you seeing any trends that are going to help you delineate these potentials? Yep, so one of the key ones that we've um, engaged is we've engaged with CSIRO. So CSIRO's looked at some of the historic um, electromagnetic airborne surveys that um, Geoscience Australia did. So they were spaced about 20 kilometres apart um, and then we've been able to relate that to uh, where we've got a couple of drill holes and then we've reprocessed that data with CSIRO and we can now look into the earth effectively with that data and you can see the clays sitting in a nice little band with granites in, interdispersed between them all. So you can actually clearly see where that sits now. Uh, we've actually got the airplane in the uh, sky at the moment so they'll be down there for about three to four weeks and we're now going to a 400 metre spacing on those. So really what that's then trying to do is map all the clay locations both in terms of expanse and then thickness, and then map in the granites and other things as well. And then that gives us um, better targets. And then anything that's got, say, a high sand covering on top, it's probably not going to be economic to start with, so we want to have something that's only got five metres with 20 metres of clay. Oh, so you can actually delineate the sand from the clay. That's right. And uh, you can then also delineate it from the um, granites as well. So the geophys is really, um, the granites don't have any conductivity effectively whereas the, the clays have got water and salty water generally contained with them. So clays are quite obviously contain yep, a lot of water. Yep. Um, and that's what you're seeing, the conductivity measurements hitting there. So they're highly conductive and that then differentiates between the two. And the clays, uh, the sands obviously sit above and they don't have that same conductivity as, as clays. Yeah, I think it's probably good to highlight that you, you, it's the ability to find the clay, not the ability to find the rare earths. You gotta find the clay first. That's right. Then you gotta bring out the old truth machine and then find the rears. That's right. Yeah. So I mean, the, the theory on the source is you've got these Barania granites that are out there from hundreds of millions of years ago, and they've all been weathered down, and they've been the source of the and holding all the granites, and then that's all been weathered down into the clays and then concentrated up over time uh, into these clay zones. And what we do see is we do see, a, um, from the historic drilling at least, um, the higher or the upper saprolites have got a slightly lower grade to the deeper saprolites, which then says something's mobilised down and re-precipitated out at some stage, um, or it's closer to the granites, and the granites have obviously um, got a higher grade uh, potential there as well. And I guess you haven't done enough work to sort of try and, apart from what you've just described, trying to look at the chemistry and how they relate to the type of clay or the um, relative comparison of conductivity and, and grade, I guess. Yeah. Would that be something that could be done? So the conductivity and grade probably can't be done, but in terms of what we're doing now with CSIRO, is we've got all the core trays, we've obviously got the recent drilling works that are uh, there. We haven't got the assays yet, but we're looking forward to those assays coming in. But we'll put it into their high locker machine, which will then help us identify the different uh, components. We're going to do some XRD work with them, with Murdoch University as well. We're also talking to University of Queensland. Um, Anstow's also going to be doing some work on the metallurgy front, so we're trying to pick all the smartest guys in the room that have the technologies that can then help us figure out where the best location is, but the best metallurgy and then the best economics, because it's not just going to be purely about finding the highest grade. It's going to be finding the best grade, but with the best extractable metallurgy, and then closest um, to surface and a whole heap of mining economics that then drive a, a profitable mine, really. I guess in some ways... Um the, you, you're trying to compete against um, the China market and the China reserves, yep. and the issue is that they are the ones that had the most amount of years of experience in terms of what we just described. Right? Yep. Um, call it whatever levels you want, but they they know that how to look for this stuff. Yep. Um, is that 
something that you guys are, um, want to look to have a relationship or is that a no-no in terms of geopolitical as we speak? Look, I think everyone would want a relationship and learn off everyone. Um, everyone also protects their own IP to some extent as well. Because it's very IP-driven. It is, yeah. So a lot of the Chinese-based rare earths are actually clay-based rare earths. Um, so there's a lot of similarities between what we're doing and not. Some of theirs are more uh, what they call ionic clays. Um, in Australia, there's lots of claims of having ionic clays and we're all ionic clay-based um, rare earths. But the reality is there's going to be a portion of everyone's ore bodies that's ionic, but to get the recoveries you need to make it economic, um, you're going to have to do more than just ionic clay um, processing. You're going to have to put a bit of acid in there to then get the highest recoveries you can. So, yes, we'd love to talk to the Chinese, we'd love to get the technology over there, but obviously there's um, some geopolitical issues uh, floating around in the mo world at the moment, so we'll see how that plays out over time. But obviously there's also funding coming from a lot of the Australian, European, um, American side of things as well. I think it's more than geopolitical, I guess it's more IP, um, yep. because it's, it's, as you said, you know, it's really IP driven mm. in, in a sense. But but Ansto's got a lot of IP as well. So Ansto's been yeah. doing this for lots of people now. Mm. They've also been looking at the downstream processing where they do the solvent extractions to try and then get out close to your final products for magnets and things. So there's IP that's been developed, especially around Ansto, that then can be applied elsewhere. But there's also the exploration techniques of how to find it and then go through the steps. Because every there's a lot of clay rare earth people popping up at the moment and there's going to be a lot of uneconomic ones, a bit like lithium, uh, seven, eight years ago where there was a boom, a whole heap of people didn't make it, but a couple of them did. Yeah, well, us geos, we always get the last straw, mate. We, we're the least important people on the ground, but everyone tells us we're really important just to to give us that, that vote of confidence so that we'll keep working. Yeah, that's it's right. like a little sheep, you feed them, and we, we're, we're happy in the paddocks. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when you mention ionic clays, um, because the whole, when, when this thing started, it was ionic clays, and then someone goes, oh, not quite that. Can you give us a geology 101? I know you're <laughs> metallurgist, but yeah, for us to get an understanding of what that means or what's out there. Yep. So the clay is really a host to a large extent, and um, it's got a whole heap of positive and negative ions on the clay, effectively. Uh, the ionic clays mean that you've got these sort of floating around uh, rare earth elements, effectively, or minerals, and they've sort of loosely associated with the clays. So on an ionic basis, then you should be able to put a, a different solution on there that displaces those bonds effectively and then pushes it out into the solution and makes it available then to recover. So that's the basic really high level um, ionic clay side of things. But I think what we'll also find is the clays themselves, you've got a little bit of ionic nature happening, but the clays themselves also have in solid still um, a certain amount of uh, non-ionic clays that then need to be released generally with a hydrochloric acid or a sulfuric acid. To so the ionic the is where the rare earth sit? The ionic. I reckon it's both. I reckon it's a okay. mixture of the ionic and also the, uh, the clay particles themselves. Because the clay particles are just uh, leftover granites effectively. Would that just be like the host rather than the where the ionic part is interacting with or is it just something holding it? Uh, I think uh, it's a mixture of both there. So there's the host where it's um, holding it but then I think the clays also have a certain amount of rare earths contained within the clays. I guess, you know, I don't know where we, we covered it. I guess it's too early for you to see any relationship between the granites and where it could be. Is, is that what you were saying before, I think? Yeah, so we think if you look at the area, there's multiple granites in the area, so massive area. So they've all formed at different stages and a bit like a diamond mine. I used to work in diamonds. You've got a kimberlite pipe and that's got lots of diamonds and the other one doesn't next door to it. So we might find something very similar in these. Or you'll find different uh, properties like metallurgical properties um, or depth and other things. So the key for us is to figure out where the thickest clays are and then go test it. And then we'll probably find that there's different coloured clays or there's different properties that then says that's the one to go for over this area over there. And we'll figure that out over the next 12, 18 months probably. I think a lot of people don't appreciate how early this is. This is almost like going to the moon kind of thing in terms of what we're trying to do, right? Because we're learning, as you said, that you, we don't quite understand where everything sits yet, but we know it's there. Um, a, a bit like lithium, you know, lithium is a, a really a very extraction where that ability to extract the lithium out of the minerals is still the key, more important the key than finding the spot you mean. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, we're used to nickel and where it's a, 
we, we know ha exactly how to do it already. It's no longer an issue. Yeah. Whereas I think the lithium space and rare so still has that component, still the uncertain way. component. That's I, right. I, yeah. I mean, the Chinese have been doing it for years, so it's known, but trying to get that IP into Australia is probably what we're developing. Uh, the other interesting thing with uh, sort of clay-based rare earths versus, say, hard rocks like Linus, is you just don't have that big front-end hard rock crushing, grinding power generation required um, to get it to the stage where, where clay already is, where it's already family grind, and then you can treat it. So that's why these lower-grade deposits are actually going to be as economic as the higher-grade deposits, because a lot of the hard work's already done by nature. Yeah, yeah. So that's what you're looking for as well from that side of things. And I guess in some ways, s size does matter in this game because you need the volume. I is that a fair comment or is that... Look, I sort of look at um, our deposit. If you, Obviously, I'm not going to promote a number, but if you look at 10 kilometres... Please do. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at, we've got 30 kilometres by 60 kilometres, but let's narrow it down to really easy numbers. So 10 kilometres by 10 kilometres... By 10 metres of thickness, you can do the maths yeah, pretty yeah. quickly, you get to a billion tonnes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, not that whole 10 kilometres, not going to be full of clay and it's not going to be economic on all of it. So you can downgrade that to certain areas, but suddenly you're talking hundreds of millions of tonnes. Yeah. Um, so we're not talking tens of millions of tonnes like the high grade guys that are narrow sort of pits, so you're talking massive areas. Uh, to some extent, I sort of relate it to a mineral sands type mine or even um, Alcoa type mines in terms of uh, their bauxite. So you're going to be strip mining certain areas and then rehabilitating behind yourself. Yeah. So it's going to be a long, ongoing process and look, I reckon there's potentially multiple generations out there, but let's do the work and get a first mine up. And as most people know, you've got to get the payback in the first five to seven years. And then after that, you can make lots of money. Yeah, would you be safe to say that it's like a beneficiation process, whether your project works or not? Because if you can extract a lot out, then you're much better of than the guy who can. Yeah, so it's probably less on a beneficiation, which is more the grinding side of things, getting it down. Yeah, but, for. Um, well, enrichment yeah. uh, uh, process, yeah. I guess. That's you, right. It better extract more out is better than someone who can't extract as much. Yeah, that's right. So it always comes down to, if you can get these rare earth clay-based things, they're only going to have 50 to 70% recoveries. So they're not going to get 100% recovery like a gold mine or might get in the 90s. Yeah. So it is going to be how, what's your recovery based on putting through lots of tonnes. Yep. So from that point of view, yes. So um, spin to grass, is it, what, what's the differences, similarities? A yep. uh, grass patch, I should say. Yep. Um, so grass patch was uh, sort of, we picked up some anomalies in the groundwater of all things. So there's um, some of the highest grade rare earths actually found in the water table uh, in that area in grass patch. So it's part of why we picked it up. There's... A few granites, but a lot less than uh, the splinter rock area. So for us, it's it's looking at what those anomalies mean and then trying to figure out where the source is. Um, has it been flowing down from years from somewhere further north or to the east or somewhere else? Or is it a completely different system how it's formed? So for us, there's probably three or four different targets there. Uh, again, we're flying the uh, AeroMag, ElectroMag uh, works across those uh, deposits over the next two weeks. And hopefully we'll see where the clays are. But who knows, we might find a copper deposit or a, a nickel deposit or anything else out there as well with these um, magnets and, and that we're flying over there. I get that's sort of my um, question. One of the questions is what, what other possibilities could there be? Because you're not too far from the Albany Fraser. Range, I think yep. you're right in there even, and the edge of it or in it, right? That's right, yep. So is there any science there? Because, you know, you, you look like you're in... In, in pastoral land, but you know, you could be the Julema of Esperance. Could be. I mean, the grass patches, pastoral land, splinter rocks, uh, vacant ground land, so two different systems from that point of view. But I think until you fly something like what we're doing at 400 metres, you can't tell what's there. Yeah. It's, you, you can try and uh, drill a hole wherever you want, but you're not doing it on any um, smarts effectively. So for us, it's about coming up with the smarts, doing things smarter than the next guy, and then. Um, hopefully targeting the best uh, locations we can get for a nickel or a copper. There's plenty of nickel in the area, Nova Nickel's in there, you've got Ravensthorpe just around the other side. Uh, Dundas announced some interesting results and they border to us to the north, so we'll see what's there. Hopefully we've got multiple commodities. Well, you know, um, I know I can say it and you can. Um, lots of granites, you're not that far away from Mount Catlin. Are these 
granites have little things sticking out of it called pegmatites? They could do. Um, there's potential for them out there. Um, yeah. But until we go out there and look. I mean, there's one of the local guys that said he's seen some outcropping uh, copper out there as well. So uh, there could be a whole heap of different minerals we discover out of this. Because as I said, um, it's the size of the Australian Capital Territory. It's a massive area we're dealing with. There hasn't been much work in that area, has there? Historical no. for... Historically, there's people look for gold a long time ago. Yeah. But... Um, not in terms of serious uh, other geology type works. Because most of the focus is slightly north of you to its Norseman. Yep. But this part to its Esperance really hasn't had much historical... No. People have been there, looked at it, and then generally dropped all the tenements, and that's why we were able to pick them up, and we didn't have to do any deals with anyone. We actually just pegged them ourselves. So It's exciting. I mean, I can sense it from, a, you know, as I said, you know, and an eternally optimist... Um, exploration geologists, it's really exciting because uh, it really opens up possibilities out there if you're already getting, you know, you're seeing your clays with rares and, yep. um, you know, I, I don't doubt you'll find something else there because um, not far off that, you you got um, the polymetallic in um, Ravensthorpe there and yep. things like that. So, you know, back in the days when I was around there, I didn't realise that was so active anyway. Yeah. And the things weren't sexy back then as well. I know when I did my degree 25 years ago, yeah. rare earth weren't even really mentioned in uh, metallurgy. Yeah, it was yeah. gold, copper, coal type thing. Coal's obviously out the window now. Um, iron ore sort of was just bulk processing. It wasn't really metallurgy. So uh, rare earths is actually something good, something new. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It's um, really interesting stuff. Um, I guess, you know, we you, you've covered a lot of my, my sort of questions here. Um and and the we we sort of talked about the economic conditions it's it's really uh extraction and 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 really it's complicated right it's not so straightforward yeah. as as your other commodities does that make it difficult for you guys to market that in terms of going to the markets hey you know i've got this great project yeah. and then knowing full well that they haven't really got the full picture yeah the key um question that i get nowadays is not about necessary tons or if it's there is can you get it out um, so from a metallurgy point of view, hence metallurgy from me, we've also got um, another smart metallurgist on our board as a, one of the directors, uh, Mitch Sloan, so he works for Alcoa as one of their strategists there as well, So, but he's got a PhD in these type of things. So that's the key driver. I think in terms of economics, yes, you can sell the product. Uh, who you sell the product to is going to be the key thing. Uh, having developed a project all the way through to the end, the hardest parts are generally getting the debt and equity side of things. Uh, to get the debt, you need good recoveries, obviously, but you also um, need an off-taker. And the off-taker's probably been the key stumbling blocks for a lot of Arafuras and Hastings. They're getting there now. Hastings has taken over a portion of NEO recently, which is a downstream processor. And then that's given them then probably the access to the uh, uh, reasonable off-taker that's actually bank-worthy. And then the banks can then finance those type of things like that. So I think that's probably going to be the hardest part going forward, convincing uh, banks or the governments to actually fund you. That's a good... Um, Australian banks just don't fund new things, so... No, I, I, they're very conservative. Once it's up and running, they'll actually uh, they'll give you some funding, but uh, once it's proven. But uh, this early stage, um, last... Uh, project I did, we were using Export Credit Agency, which is funding out of Germany effectively, which helps obviously the dairy industries, but our industry as well. Uh, we also used uh, Northern Australian Infrastructure Fund, which is Australian government. Yeah. Um, so you had to go to those alternate suppliers. Otherwise you go to uh, some of the guys that will charge you 10% interest rates, plus a royalty, plus take oh, yeah. half your firstborn baby as well. So, And that's not good for Australia. It might be good for them, but um, it's not good for new projects coming through. On that note, um, is there an initiative from you know likes of yourself and your peers who are actually talking to the government and say, look, you know, maybe this. Is the... I had this. The question comes from uh, my um, conversation on on my Samso insights, but I'm on the other side. Yep. Our discussion was basically, you know, is this is this a time where maybe we we should actually be talking to the government to say, this is your best opportunity to corner. Well, not say corner the market, but take a a chunk of this market yep. because of as we've discussed the geopolitical and all that kind of sense hmm. 
is this has, has, there, has there been an, an initiative to go and talk to them? Well, I think uh, the Hard Rock guys have been doing it for a while. So the Linuses, uh, the Arafuras, and uh, Hastings. So they're at the, that stage where they want to develop something. They need the bank debt. So uh, you saw a Luca as well. They got some funding out of the federal government um, as well. So I think from that point of view, yes, there's discussions happening from the clay-based rare earths. It's probably a new industry. Um, we are catching up with a lot of the guys within the, the provincial area of Esperance, so the Mika, uh, Mount Ridley, Heavy Rare Earth guys, we're all starting to talk. Uh, there is actually a conference in Canberra, uh, Australian ANU, Australian National University is running it, uh, okay. 1st and 2nd of November, where we're presenting along with a lot of other guys for two days, the government guys are there, and look, I think that will then start that conversation about what do we need, so most of these places, a bit like lithium to some extent, we're all going to produce some form of concentrate, some better than others, and then it needs to go somewhere. Uh, where that goes currently is generally has to go to China. Um, as much as you might send it to Germany or somewhere else, it all ends up in China to do the final processing. With NEO probably being the one of the only ones outside of uh, China uh, in Europe that is actually doing downstream processing. So what we really need to do as an industry is probably get together with the Australian government and saying, we really need a, a centralised downstream processing facility that can take all of our concentrates and then um, help that funding process and then that can then develop a whole heap of new industries, a bit like you're seeing in lithium now with battery minerals or on the Quinana Strip where they're trying to do more further processing. But I don't think one company can fund it by themselves and uh, to make it of economic scale you probably need three or four projects pushing into there, which creates its own problems as well. Um, having been involved in a, a port development once upon a time uh, in Iron Ore up north uh, with three or four parties in there, different timings and everything else uh, doesn't it's quite match. It's just the one that never happened. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so uh, it just becomes hard, but you need someone to build it and they'll come type arrangement as well. Yeah. Now maybe that's not in Australia, maybe that's in Europe, maybe that's somewhere else, but we should be doing it in Australia if we've got the the mining resources and the, and the know-how. I guess there's some credence to what Indonesia and the Philippines and all they're doing where they're saying no more raw materials going out, you need to process it, value add it and then send it out because that, I think if, if Australia ever had that kind of thought, um, this would be the best time to do it, I guess. Yeah, that's right. you know, you've got all your raw products, there's lots of talks about how WA is the lithium mecca of the world and, yep. and things like that and why not have that and then you value it and create more industries and yep. um you know put it all in wa so um we can you know call ourselves a different country that's right but, <laughs> but <laughs> you know from everyone will be right <laughs> yeah but i think this is almost a, a good time i wouldn't say the best time good time to have that discussion i guess it's got to start somewhere i think uh, you're seeing a diversification that needs to happen anyway so wa or australia being reliant on coal and iron ore to a large extent so we need to move away from coal. Um, people are talking hydrogen, obviously. Um, I'll talk, I probably should talk hydrogen and esperance and solar uh, at a later time here, but um, that's really just moving the goalpost from one oil baron to another oil baron, almost, um, to some extent. Whereas uh, you can see a lot of people now talking about electrification is the way to go. Um, and if you can electrify your cars or electrify your homes, um, then that obviously makes uh, the inflation risk lower because you're not reliant on someone exporting hydrogen, for example. You're using your solar panels to drive your car. And what do you need to do in a car? You need neopridium and praseodymium as well. So that's where those things start really coming together. So there's, if the governments are looking at it from a smart point of view, there's a massive economic shift from decarbonisation into these renewable um, systems. Uh, you can lower people's costs going forward, um, but at a little bit of a, a capital input over the next few years. So there's a big opportunity there, and if we can downstream process it and get it done in Australia, then we'll be the winners. I think that's the lithium part. I think you can start to see that happening now in, the, in Quinana and things like that. That yep. potentially that could be that. You know, it's probably maybe it's good that it's being done voluntarily or market sensitive, yep. rather than government putting say, hey, from now on you can't do this. Right? I think in some ways it's good. Yep. Um, nationalism is not such a great thing i think it, it scares people away it scares but it, it, to some extent you need a long-term vision as well and most companies bankers and all that only want three four year paybacks so you're never going to do anything that's nation building or long-term future 
So dictatorship, mate. That would get it going. <laughs> yeah, we got Mark McGowan there, so <laughs> <laughs> he's not a dictator, I'll say, but um He's got a halo on his head, <laughs> <that's> mate. <right. laughs> um look, I guess we all talk about the increasing demand of rare earths and is is and, and we, we sort of touched on that. Now is that do you see that is that because we of the electrification or is there another use that's demanding rare earths? So there's probably three or four different main uses that it's going into. So electric vehicles is probably one of the big ones. Uh, so it's going into those motors. So where you go look at a Tesla, you've got a single motor or two motors and they're all uh, NDPR magnets. So they're 10 times stronger than a normal magnet. And then effectively what they're doing is they're making you drive further by using the energy that's stored in those batteries uh, being used more efficient. So without those, you'd only have a 100K um, range instead of a 400 kilometer range. Okay. So that's one of the key drivers there. Um, there's one or two percent market penetration at the moment in electric vehicles in Australia. So you can see how huge that demand is. Uh, the other demand's coming from uh, wind turbines. So again, all these motors, um, similar type technology is using it in the car, but just doing it in reverse, using those magnets to twist and generate um, more power more efficiently, effectively. And then a lot of the consumer goods um, around. So think of your reverse cycle air conditioner. That's got a uh, NDPR. Can't do without that. Yep. So that's got some NDPR in there as well in those uh, inverters. Um, so again, just the smarter things that are around. Your phone's got it. Your earbuds that you're lifting in, they've got uh, NDPR batteries in there to make it smaller and uh, more efficient. News flow going forward. Um, I can see a presentation in your September. You got this flow chart. Yep. Are we still on track with that? Or yep. So we've been actually hitting all our targets quite well at the moment. So. Finished our drilling, uh, pending assays as we speak. So there'll be some assay results probably come out over the next two to six weeks, um, progressively over, because we've drilled 100 kilometres in terms of length. Uh, so we're not going to get all of them all at once, but we'll um, get those progressively. We've got that plane flying up in the air at the moment, doing the electromag down um, across 4,000 square kilometres of land. So we'll get those results towards the end of this year, and then that'll help us target. Um, we've also got, uh, we'll put an exploration target out, no doubt, um, based on what we see from the res assay results and everything else. We've got some infill drilling that we'll do uh, next year as well, uh, going into a jort compliant, hopefully large mineral resource, and then into a scoping study. So plenty of news flow over the next few months and weeks and even into the next year. Time for you to sell your soul, you know, why invest in OD6? If you uh, look at discoveries, okay, we know there's something there, but uh, where people make the most money is generally going from finding it, there's a big share price run that will happen on great, uh, hopefully, uh, dual results, and then hopefully good metallurgy results going forward as well. So that's where the best time is to invest in these type of companies like ours. And then you sort of hit those lulls and ups and downs as you're going through the studies and development uh, whilst you're getting those risks. So if there was any, uh, ever a time to uh, invest, we invest now. Okay. Um... Normally I have something to give to you, but you know it's hard to get good workers these days and um, we're missing the coffee and um, you're the second person this round that we've forgotten and left it behind. <laughs> so it's a, it's a rain check on that, but um, look Brett, it's a good story. I mean, I've been, I was chasing a lot of guys in this sector because I see the growth and I'm happy that I'm getting a few guys come in to, to, to share the story because it's a sector that's unique, it's different. It's not your typical copper nickel story, but I think it's um, growing space. Um, the world's gonna need another 10 or 20 mines. And they're gonna be rare earth mines, they're gonna be copper mines, they're gonna be nickel mines, but uh, there's multiple ones in Australia that are needed. So hopefully everyone gets a couple of these mines up in Australia. Oh, look, I think uh, there's no doubt that the move away from hydrocarbon, the new energy source, I, I call it the our, our version of the industrial revolution of energy change would require more minds to happen. Yeah. And I think the the holdback has always been, oh, you, you know, you dirty bastards, you're digging holes in the ground. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's the case. You know, the, the ESG component has will come in and show people that, you know, mo nine out of ten, nine point nine miners out of ten are responsible hmm. miners, right? So You and, can't come and rape and pillage nowadays. That's no, I don't think that's the case, but I think that's the stigma that goes with us. And uh, Thank you, Brett. Um, fantastic. I hope we continue the journey, and I'd love to see um, 
our next conversation you know, and your results and where we go from here. Because yep. I think um, you've given us a really, really good uh, outlook of things. And uh, I think that's uh, what I've been searching for someone to come and tell us how to view a project. I think that's been a good conversation. So thank you. Beautiful. Thanks for your time, Bob. Great to be here.